Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the greatest professional wrestler of all time, your friend and mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, Conrad Thompson, I'll kick off this show. Happy belated Father's Day. I mean, my man, uh, I didn't really get an opportunity. You know, I was traveling, Triple Mania this weekend, uh, landed, uh, got right to the important stuff, Conrad. Not once, not twice, but three times. Old Hammer and Hank snapped the line yesterday. We didn't land the big catfish. Conrad, we had, I'm not kidding you, we had three. I size. So when I get done uh, with our podcast today, I've got, I think I got three uh, work calls, uh, but it, it, I got an hour break. I'm, I'm headed up to uh, bait and tackle. Uh, I have finally give in. I'm not going to try to catch a catfish on an uh, eight pound test line. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to upgrade the we're going to upgrade the gear today. Uh, we have broke enough lines. Uh, the queen is upset now. She filmed this yesterday. That may be for the archives. She could not quit laughing because I said, I say the word. I, I said shit as it got it up to the dock. Got right. I got. It, I said shit, and all of a sudden it was an echo. Cody was. Yeah, shit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's the best. Anyway, happy belated Father's Day. Triple mania. We've, uh, I don't know, man. I don't even know where to start. Pretty fired up. Summer. It's hot. The heat is here. You had bad storms yesterday. I no, had- no. I didn't have any storm. We lost power here with no storms. It was no Oh, rain. I didn't get that. I didn't no. get that memo part. No, I, w- had- I woke up to absolutely no power today, but there was not a raindrop, no clouds, no thunder, nothing. What happened? The boys in Alabama didn't connect the extension cord out on the. Um, I what, guess. Okay, you got to rename it. It's not the Conradison. What? What is the uh, Costa? Uh, I have the, no the, idea. I yeah, have we'll no come, idea. We will definitely come up with something. So uh, Tennessee baseball is Alabama uh, in the World Series. Alabama baseball team in the World Series. I don't know. Do we even play baseball in Alabama? They're okay, not. They're, they're, they're not. Tennessee is. They're the okay. number one. Yeah. Well, we're, how y'all we're, doing in the cross list this year? We'll have to ask Hook. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today. If you haven't already, go check out Triple Mania. Jeff nearly caused a riot again because that's what Jeff Jarrett does. And as you might uh, be interested to hear, his man Satnam Singh picked up a big win over the weekend. It's a big deal to be at a Triple Mania. It's an even bigger deal to get a win over a legend, huh? In the last match in the main event, it's pretty amazing by man Satnam. Uh, so well, this is June, so... I'll give it 90 days ago. I don't think my man Sotnam understood what AAA was about. And here he is like a lightning bolt debuted in Monterey. Uh, and then, uh, came on strong and, uh, vamp Vampiro truly a legendary status. Uh, all kidding aside, um, huge box office attraction. This is kind of his 2024. It's, it's not a, uh, a la Ric Flair last match. It's not a Vampiro last match. It's a, it's basically, it's the last time of, of his entire tour. So he's officially retiring at the end of the year. So in a lot of ways, Tijuana Saturday night was his last match in Tijuana and Alberto Patron ADR got on the microphone after the match and said some really nice things, brought a few people, uh, legit Conrad in the audience to tears. It was, it was an emotional night through and through. And I'm, you know, as, as, as me and Sotnam were basically walking uh, backstage, but we were walking in center field back to our uh, trailer. I, I kind of soaked it all in and I'm like, you hear that? And he just, he, you know, uh, talking with him and I'm like, Hey man, that dude is a legend. and He has sold out lots of building, lots of tickets. And I said, uh, you just took him to the woodshed and probably his last match in Tijuana. So it was special. You know, I, uh, I soaked in, uh, I soaked it in all in too. So baseball stadium, lots of cerveza throwing everywhere. Uh, God, man, those guys. Oh, I got to tell you a story about us leaving the building, but uh, they don't like me down there. God. <laughs> I have, they just don't like me. Well, we love you and we're glad that you're here with us. And uh, we hope that you'll go see Jeff at AEW Dynamite, AEW Collision. Tickets are on sale now, AEWTIX.com. And of course, you can see them all the time at shoesbaseball.com. But we're going into our Wayback Machine. Talking about something that happened 15 years ago this week. It went down on June 21st, 2009 at the Palace of Auburn Hills in Auburn Hills, Michigan. Yeah, the same Palace of Auburn Hills where Nitro 100 happened and Lex Luger beat Hulk Hogan for the 
big gold belt back when the NWO was running wild in WCW. Well, in 2009, TNA ran there called the show Slammiversary. It's the fifth Slammiversary event the prior year. And you guys were in uh, South Haven, Mississippi. Now that feels a little more Southern wrestling, but the palace of Auburn Hills, man, how does that come to be? It was pretty cool. The, um, so bound for glory. Oh, six was in Plymouth, which is a suburb. And I got to do a callback. I got to tell you about me and Sottenham. So we'll, we'll put a button on that, but I want to come back to that. But anyway, palace at Auburn Hills, my ADD is really already kicking in here. We're, um, you're you're driving the boat here. You're your producer, your director, your on air host. Silva's uh, asleep uh, down in South Texas. That's okay. He's got Montezuma's uh, revenge. It's like he was down there with you. Oh, is he doing some curb stomping? No, I mean I think legitimately he's uh, in the hospital, hooked up to an IV right now. So thoughts and prayers to uh, to Dave Silva and his family. Take that back. I, uh, that uh, no, he just ate awful. too much water burger. That's all. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just got to, seriously, they're going to have to drill that big turd out and he's fine. <laughs> hey, how's Cassio doing? Man, we'll have to see, you know, I just talked to the plumber. They, uh, they told me that they can't even find the parts for the damage he's done to the sewer lines. Like the sewer lines have been replaced with all the Tonka toys, but the pump and, and, and I've spent like eight grand on a pump to get the doo-doo back to the road for him, uh, up the mountain. But now there's uh, some sort of a relay switch or a breaker. Or I don't know what he did. I think he's like, you know, back in the day, if you watched the Rocky movies, he talked about, you know, uh, crap and thunder. I, I think, I think maybe he, I think maybe Cassio craps thunder. So, you know what? I didn't even bring this to, to light last week. Um, your former place, Cassio's current place right now, it is on a hill, right? Yep. Yeah. And so in the plumbing world, they, they kind of allude to a term. Does it got gravity flow? Like, Downhill? Well, so no, it goes up. That's the issue. So where I'm at, you've got a, a little pump, and then we pump it up to the street. Because as you recall, I'm like down a little bit, and then because I'm on the side of a mountain, as you know. So oh, it's got so it truly is a gravity flow for your plumbing situation. My doo doo so, goes up. My my so, doo, I got a doo doo elevator is what I had to put in for Casio. Yeah, so, yeah. so so Casio basically is blown out the pump because it's working double and triple and quadruple time. Well, they said that, you know, they were concerned about his health because they were like, he must, he's got to be putting concrete. Like, I mean, Conrad, we talked about, you were there 15 years, multiple parties. Mm -hmm. It's the system has never had that much taxing on. No, no, uh -uh, nothing. But I think he did a Mitchell family reunion and you got four or five Mitchells together. I mean, they put enough mud in my lines that they, he was like, man, we're going to have to bring Tonka toys down here. They had to move boulders. We had to rent heavy machinery. I'm not kidding. This is real. We're, uh, we're more than 10,000 uh, deep just so he could take a dump. <laughs> okay. So Palace of Auburn Hills, segue. Not a oh, dump. So nice building. Appreciate those folks. <laughs> no, we were fired up about that. I, we all knew that it was it, it was at a risk because uh, the building in Plymouth, the suburb of Detroit, um, was we had a, a hell of a house there in 06. Um, I was looking for those numbers just on attendance. Uh, and I know in the research, uh, it, it had the, the year before and the year after on the same anniversary. But anyway, we did very well. So now coming back uh, three plus years later um, to the, we'll call it the big building, which now the palace is torn down. Um, you know, it was a risk, but they wanted events at that time. And this was back, uh, as we're talking about, obviously 2009, when the, the, the city of Detroit in venues was in a, a flux because palace is the old building. They were building new ones downtown and there's, so, there's several in the, anyway, it was going to be a risk, but they gave us a hell of a building deal. Uh, the show f turned out, look, it, it ain't no way we was selling out a NBA basketball arena, but, um, it did well, a lot of good vibes, uh, great building deal. And so it made sense to us, but, uh, you know, we were all hesitant on how are we going to scale it, make it look. But, uh, I remember in the office, we're like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to make this, they've got a half curtain and like is so appropriate. And in, in a lot of venues these days, they just cut it in half house. And I'm like, okay, this will work. Well, it did work. You guys drew about 4,000 folks there. And, uh, let's talk about the ratings as we build towards this pay-per-view. The show comes down 
with a 1.05 rating and 1.52 million viewers for the May 21st showing and uh, segment by segment, uh, we're seeing how things are doing. Like the Team 3D promo with the British Invasion, that gained 14,000 viewers. Uh, the team um, of the Eric Young versus Sting match somehow lost uh, 29,000 viewers. The Kurt Angle Matt Morgan match falls off a cliff. And that cliff was designed by Awesome Kong and Angelina Love. That gained 130,000 viewers, but she lost 101 of them to Kurt Angle and Matt Morgan. Now that jumped out at me. Like a sore thumb. By the way, if you're wondering, when Samoa Joe wrestled Jeff Jarrett, 43,000 people came right back. But I know that it's been criticized a lot, and I'm not here to defend it or really discuss what should have happened. I'm just saying the facts are, whether you were a fan of the segment or not, the knockout division was a ratings bonanza pretty damn consistently for TNA. Is that right? No doubt. And, and, to kind of uh, get up to 20,000, 30,000 feet, just kind of on the time period of TNA, because I had to do that myself. Uh, Main Event Mafia was formed basically in the fall of 08. Uh, we got it rocking and rolling uh, in 09. And the spring is when we, the, the ratings week after week after week. And look, the Main Event Mafia versus Frontline story w- was fantastic. We had built the foundation of Gale and Kong and the knockouts division and added to them and super diversified. There was, you know, 10, 12 ladies in that division that all had unique, different personalities. Uh, and then just the momentum was building. But of course the summertime comes around, um, the HUD, uh, the, the, the amount of overall amount of people watching TV obviously always goes down in May and June. And it's kind of appropriate. We're talking about this, the NBA basketball, uh, Hockey wasn't such a big deal back in then. It was much more regional or city by city, but it was a it was definitely a challenge. So we weren't at our peak ratings, but May and June were good. Uh, but as you just kind of pointed out, rolling into this and and the this would have been our seven year anniversary. Uh, but I, that jumped off the page with me too. Is is that the knockouts and not necessarily just Kong because Kong carried that division. Because of her position and everything, but man, um, we're going to talk about Daphne. It just, it was, uh, it, the, you said it, knockouts were always very, very, very strong numbers. And, and this is something too, that I thought through as far as our ratings, if we're going to keep going into that is, is that we never had picture in picture. And this is the era where I want to say spike added a minute worth of commercial per hour than when we originally started because they were selling and create more revenue and all that. So I think there were some commercial breaks on our TV show that went up to a four minute break with no content. So when you think of gained and lost viewers, sometimes you put a three and a half, four minute break completely in a 15 minute quarter hour. It's not completely reflective. Uh, although you, you know, you can't dismiss it, but, um, yeah, that that's, uh, that's the ratings game. That's why week week by week basis, you can pull your hair out, and kind of look at, got to look at the quarterly rolling averages, as they say. Well, it's worth mentioning too. This is the lowest rating TNA had gotten for quite a while at this point, because you're head to head with the playoffs in the NBA. It's the Lakers versus the Nuggets. That's a big game wow. then now forever. Uh, but I, I think sometimes people forget that, Hey, you guys were battling that too. It's not just a function of, Hey, it was WCW or AEW's battle, uh, but you guys were battling there as well. The next week you do a 1.18 rating. That's 1.6 million homes. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Midway. They were doing your games and uh, it's written here in the observer. Midway has a $33 million bid for its assets from Warner brothers as noted last week, which if accepted could doom the TNA game because they're not going to pick it up. Midway will be accepting other bids for its assets through June 24th. And a court hearing will determine high bidder on July 1st. Another bidder could pick up the TNA game or after most of its assets are purchased from Warner brothers, they may keep one development studio open and attempt to market the game. Although most likely that won't happen. So we know that, um, you guys were working on the game. Can you tell us a little bit about this midway bankruptcy and how that affected you? Or you were concerned at the time it might affect you. Yeah. The game was out. I don't know what your specific question is, but, um, the, 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 
time in this. I think the the big issue was yeah, it came it came out the prior September, but I mean you were going to do like a follow up, I thought, right? We, yeah, the, the next game, the collections, the the basically the overall deal and and the relationship on game two, game three, game four, because they soaked a lot of money. You know, we did uh, that AJ uh, Kurt Angle commercial spot. Uh, Midway soaked a lot of money into it. Their marketing, not like some major game, but they did put marketing power behind it, and it did relatively well. It did didn't knock down. It's that's a a lot of times that's a, a lot tougher market than people realize, but it did well well enough to know that um, maybe a sequel wasn't a slam dunk, but but yeah, it was. We were going to do another one, but. Midway had much bigger issues than a TNA game. So that was, uh, I'll say, Dallas's concern was, where does the future relationship go and where do our collections go? Because the, the the lead time on collecting revenue is substantial. I want to mention, too, that we are not yet in the era where we're doing live TV every week. So here we're taping shows, sure. and we've got some Murphy's Law-type circumstances. Here's an example. We've got a break between tapings. And, uh, or, or between shows. So the guys are just going to stay on the road between house shows in the Northwest, but Samoa Joe is going to go work out. And that's what you do when you're a professional athlete and he winds up suffering a torn tricep and then broken fingers too. Now, when you tear your tricep, most people would think you're going to be out six months, but here's the reason that's problematic in this case over the TV. That's already in the can. That's already been produced. That is going to air in the coming weeks. He's eliminated Kevin Nash, Booker T, and Scott Steiner from the King of the Mountain match. So clearly you're doing something with Joe. You've got big plans for Joe. We're building towards this pay-per-view. And one of our guys now is hurt. This is like worst case scenario, is it not? Not just one of our guys, maybe one one of the guys. Yes. That that was, and and, Conrad, I don't know that me and you have ever specifically discuss this kind of set of circumstances. So oh nine ratings are good to really good, uh, or, or the best they've ever been. The, 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 the blue sky in front of us probably in the existence of TNA had never been this blue. Yes. Our payroll had gone up, but we, and I'll say this Dallas made the decision. Hey man, there are opportunities through the 12 month rolling period. We can sub say save or yeah, we can put, yeah, we can put a lot of money directly to the to, to the bottom line. And so on a few of the four-week arcs from between pay-per-view to pay-per-view, as opposed to doing pay-per-view on a Sunday, take uh, Monday and Tuesday, which would be Monday would be the following Thursday show, and Tuesday would be the next week's Thursday show, and then come back in two weeks uh, to get the next two episodes, we decided that we were going to tape four shows in three days. Uh, on some arcs, which was, and then just make it a one trip a month and save on talent and travel and all kinds of things. But that was, I don't say this as a bitch or a gripe, but that is the set of circumstances that our financial partner wanted because they wanted to see more revenue, more, um, you know, tighten up on expenses and which would obviously create more profit. It was really tough, but this bit us in the ass big time because Joe and I don't remember the whole story about the fingers. I remember the tricep and we had had him the prior tapings kick everybody's ass to get him qualified into the King of the mountain match. Uh, we had two King of the mountain matches on the slam anniversary, uh, the seven year anniversary. And Joe was a featured player and him getting hurt from a creative standpoint. We're like, all right, Joe, <laughs> how are we going to figure this out? It ended up working out, but it was a tough ball shot to say the least. It looked like at the time we were going to wind down with Raven and Shane Douglas. Uh, it's noted in the newsletters at the time that they're going to be in for the last set of tapings and the pay-per-view. They're not going to be given long-term deals. And they're thinking about using Shane as a heel manager. In an alternate universe, I think Shane could have been a fantastic heel manager. Exactly. Did you guys get too far down the road on that thinking? I mean, he could have been one of the all-time classics in that role. So th- this was, again, such a, well, Seems like all of TNA time was unique. Um, going into Slammiversary, we wanted to do some callbacks because Shane worked with us in the Asylum days. He obviously had the ECW background when we were using Sabu and 
Sandman and all that. Uh, Shane was a producer for us at times. Uh, but at this point, when we wanted to give the, the event some nostalgia flavor, and that was why him and Raven were brought back uh, for, for the show. Uh, but yeah, in, in an alternate universe, Shane, bigger guy. So I don't know if that's a plus or a minus as far as a yeah. managerial role. But man, yeah, he's he's a hell of a talker. A good heater. I mean, he, like a lot of folks from that generation, he didn't want to get cheered under any circumstances. So he knew what he was doing as far as uh, pushing the right button. Let's talk a little bit about something that got a lot of buzz in the newsletters. There was a match that happened between Melissa Anderson and Awesome Kong during a television taping. Now, it wasn't actually taped for television. They just threw it out there as like a match for the house. But apparently it blew everyone away. And the match was so good that when it was over, Raven remarked it was the best women women's match he had seen in at least 10 years. And what he had heard, he being Dave, is that it was being compared to Kong and Gail Kim a prior year. So this has got to be something that catches everybody by surprise, maybe. And it's noted here that Anderson will not be used as cheerleader Melissa, but the uh, working idea is for her to be called Melissa Anderson, the future legend because that's an award she really, she received at the cauliflower alley club a few years prior to this. Did Melissa Anderson really blow everybody away in this match with awesome Kong? So if I recall this correctly, cause I, I mean, Dutch could verify it or, or tweak it, but Dutch was very, very high on, Hey, let's create. Okay. Kong's manager is Raisha Saeed played by Melissa Anderson. So I thought the dynamic package, because Melissa's a good talker, and she spoke with a broken accent and covered up and under the mask, but not really. A, I don't. I don't know the correct terminology for that. Yeah. But she she, she was uh, under the mask a, as the mouthpiece for Kong, and they made a really good package. And 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 me <laughs> listening to Dutch, I'm like Dutch. I don't want to screw with this package. Yeah. I, I just. It's money. It's our main event heel uh, knockout. Let, let's not. He's like, I'm telling you, there's a role for cheerleader Melissa. And I'm like, that's fine, but not now. And he wanted to push for it, push for it, push for it. So whatever, however it happened on a taping, Dutch says, I'm going to continue to push. I'll show Jeff and I'll show the people that may or may not. And it was. It was a, a dark match that tore the house down. They had a good relationship, and uh, lots of folks were raving about it. And I kind of stuck to my guns. I said, "Dutch, I I never said she couldn't go, or what? You know, the, I was I didn't expect anything less for it to be a hell of a match. I just don't want to mess with that. And we have uh, the beautiful people and ODB, and you know that we had an entire roster of knockouts. I said it's just not the right time. But anyway. They had that match. It tore the house down. Um, in, a, in future episodes, we'll we'll figure out exactly where that went. But I remember specifically, kind of around this time, that that I'm like Dutch. It, the timing's not right. So, there's your Raisha uh, Melissa Anderson story. Sarah Stock was backstage at the tapings, but not used, and she's going to start filming some vignettes to build for a debut. Uh, and we know that man, she's. What didn't she do? She's been in Japan. She's been in TNA. She's been in WWE. Now she's in AEW. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about her. What can you give us about Sarah Stock? Awesome, awesome, awesome person as a human being. But, a, I mean, a hell of a talent. And she, um, yeah, I'm trying to think where. She's Canadian, but yeah, I'm just her, the trajectory of her career. She went to Mexico, as the old folks say, and got over, kid. No, she got over down there. And uh, building out. The um, the knockouts division, we did we didn't really have that one. I don't want to say face of the knockouts division, but that one girl that was a wrestler's wrestler that just was a, and I don't want to call her high flyers. So I'm trying to, to 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 she just that that uh, uh, the wrestling was her front and center. We had so many different characters, like I said, ODB and beautiful people. Prior to that, Gail Kim, and she was somewhat of a high flyer and awesome Kong and all the different personalities. Um, but that was kind of what we were pegging Sarah for and doing vignettes on her and going to build her up that way. 
We should talk about JR. He's going to make some headlines here. Uh, I guess you had made some remarks about your WWE experience, and he was not happy. Here's what JR well, said at the time. Go ahead. Where did where did I make those comments? Well, he says it was in a YouTube link. So I, That's don't what I was wondering, like, wonder what that was. Here's what JR said. Someone sent me a YouTube link to comments made by Jeff Jarrett that were not flattering to yours truly and were fabrications to boot. But as the wrestling business has proven time and again, why let the facts get in the way of a good story? I've never wished any ill on TNA. I have many friends working there, but I really have no interest in what Jeff Jarrett may have to say about any subject I can think of at the moment. What Jeff has to say about my friendship with Steve Austin or how he remembers his last days in WWE is comparable to how entertaining it is to watch the great Kali or me dance. It's not for everybody. Jeff has the right to his opinion and I have the right to mine, but we both know the truth. So boy, uh, the context of that is old JR is not happy. And we know years later, you guys would put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And you got him on the call for new Japan and wrestling history was made. Was that an uncomfortable conversation when you guys sort of hit the reset button on your relationship or was it just uh, like riding a bicycle? No, and, and, and look, the notes didn't really say it. I assume that, w that he said that on his podcast. Now he didn't I, have a podcast back then. He was writing on the Ross report. So he had a little okay. blog that he would do on his website okay. to sell barbecue sauce. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, but, and I've said it over and over and I don't think there was anything. I'm wondering, what do y'all call it? Red ass. Yes. It, it, yes. Yeah. So I don't know what flared it up or if a fan commented or whatever it may be, but I always said, and I said it today, if you don't think, and I would have, I can't say that, that my dad or myself or Lawler or any other person running talent relations, who in the hell do I think he's going to side with the top baby face or, 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 uh, uh, uh whatever you want to say. The about assistant Jim manager. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. There you go. Assistant manager. Yeah. Yes. It, it's, it's that simple, but I'm, I'm just wondering, and I don't think we ever, I, I, I didn't uh, flesh that out, but when, when business got down to business, but it was fun to read that in the notes that the context uh, about is, I don't have nothing, something about it. It's about as fun as watching me and Kyle Lee dance, which is an entertaining line yeah. to say, give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. Well, I know you gave a shit when you guys signed a stacker Two inner extreme energy sponsorship. It's going to be on the ring. There's going to be a presence on the website, on the TV show. You're shooting commercials with Kurt angle and Booker T. You may remember once upon a time, stacker two had WWE commercials. They were using Trish Stratus, China and others. This is a big feather in the cap to get a, a brand deal like this. Who was responsible for putting those together for the company back then? So this was, um, I mean, driven by spike. Uh, and, and that was something that, yeah, we're going to get a few bucks, but the big picture is a major sponsor has come on to their network and is specifically buying TNA impact wrestling and a long-term deal. And to the point they want to do integrations and ring aprons and commercials and integrate talent, and all that. Got I can't tell you how much of a, and that's when I look back on and the different, times we do podcasts and the, and I guess you could say the, the what ifs, because this is again, Oh nine and the wheels came off at the end of this year, but getting sponsorships that were coming to the network, buying specifically our product is such a warm and fuzzy, good feel for the spike team that it creates a value to the, to the show that, yeah, you can put a number on it, but not really. It's kind of an intangible because we were a shining spot for the entire network. Um, on our side, Andy Barton, Dixie would have been heavily involved. Um, whoever else was in the marketing department at that time. I'm not sure if Al Ovedia was there at that time. A couple of different folks. But our marketing guys, Daisy Marks, but the, dri driving the ship on that. I want to ask you something fun here. This is a fun note from the observer. Most of the crew went to the famed big Texan steakhouse in Amarillo and lethal did a spot on imitation of Ric Flair for Terry Funk, including an old promo that Flair did word for word on Terry Funk from lethal and Funk was in hysterics at how good lethal was doing Flair's voice and inflections. 
Were you there for this? Because I was not, and I'm surprised I wasn't. I mean, it's super fun to just think that, you know, I mean, anytime I see Jay do it, it cracks me up, but the idea that he got to do it for Terry Funk and just seeing Terry Funk laugh at it makes me smile even now. And that was, I mean, backstage, God, I love to know the timing of this, but the black machismo character, it, it organically came about back, you know, backstage of Jay messing around, which he'll still do today. If you, if you prod him enough that, Hey man, what would Mach say about this? And he'll do a macho man. Uh, hey, what would the Nate say about this? You know how we have fun with him and all this, but his ability, Jay, I don't think people understand really how, how talent. Yeah. Jay's a great wrestler, but how talented his and his, uh, his acting chops, man. That that guy is something, but uh, it was fun to read about that. And I've seen that happen many, many times, uh, him to put people. But doing it to the Funker, yes, it's special. I know that there's 392 wrestlers under contract to AEW, so television time's at a premium. But we need to get Jay Lethal on our YouTube channel just doing Ooh. some fun stuff because that dude, can you imagine a Jay Lethal web series? Like, people would love that. Like, he is... Um, Criminally underutilized. I'll say that as a fan. You know what? I mean, we have talked about, we have got to get on these YouTube. We're building, we're building catalog. Sam Adonis. We talked about it this weekend. He has got Mexico stories for days. Yes. I mean, your head would spin. I mean, I got to hear a few this weekend. We got Jay lethal. We need to bring him on board. The Sodom stuff, the Cody stuff. What are you doing guys? Go subscribe (laughs) to the YouTube right now. And you never know who you might see. Maybe even Taz one day, because he was making notes on his Facebook. He joked about this back then. Now, uh, just to give everybody some context, he's finished up with WWE. He's got to wait out and sit on the sidelines for a bit. He's not available to be on TV until the first week of July. And he wrote on his Facebook page, the prison sentence is almost done. Dot, dot, dot. Can't wait. Uh, how quickly were you in touch with Taz when you knew that he was finishing up and might be available? See, and, and I believe Vince Russo was the first one that, that was the conduit. I, I don't know. I, 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 I I do not know because look, it's no secret. Me understanding Dallas and the budgets and the and, and everything that went with that and the the affinity that Kevin K and I mean from day one whether it's Scott Fishman Brian Diamond uh, Niels the marketing folks the Spike team they like Mike and Don so I immediately thought of Taz as a mouthpiece but obviously that that changed direction in two thousand in a nine uh, two thousand ten. But I was surprised reading that note that, that, uh, oh, Taz was kind of vocal about it on his Facebook page. The prison sentence is all, woo about that. Hey, let's talk about some live events you guys were running. I was surprised to see when you ran like in Washington, Kennewick, Washington, only 500 fans were there, but one of those fans was Nick Nolte. <laughs> Nick Nolte came to see TNA wrestling with 499 other people. What in the world? How about that? Now, Kennewick and uh, what was that run we did out there? Kennewick, uh, Kent, and then uh, up in Canada, Canada Abbotsford. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And then it was uh, a, Penticton, was a good Penticton? Penticton. Penticton. Yeah. yeah. That was a good run for us. Um, they got to argue with the numbers there, but I think they were substantially more than five. Or, but it was, and we were selling the crap out of merch. That's what I wanted to ask you about. Kennewick was 500, Kent was 800, uh, Abbotsford was 1,000. We don't know the numbers. Uh, for sure, but it says Penticton, if I said that right, is 800 fans, but he would go out of his way to be complimentary. And he said, although the crowds aren't big, those who came were hot every night on the tour and clearly watched the television show and they're into the characters, particularly beer money. But based on the merchandise sales, the brand is bigger than any of the stars because TNA logo merchandise and programs were usually the best selling stuff at the shows. That's kind of a surprise to me. I mean, the brand is what's so over. Um, were you surprised by that or is that about what you expected? Well, Don kind of given, cause Don did not come from a wrestling background. He, you know, marching, you know, 
marketing and shop at home and and not just baseball cards. I mean, Don sold Beanie Babies and just he he he's a salesman. You know him, but you knew him just all that. But hearing him talk and and me trying to piece together some wrestling pieces and then hearing my in one ear, you know, whether it's a Jerry Jarrett voice or a, a Vince McMahon voice or even a Lawler voice, you know, that it just time takes time and you've got to get established because in our, our bubble, our world, you know, at this point, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Daniels, beer money had come together. Those guys to our audience, the, the youth was uh, the youth, but yeah, the younger guys and the, 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 the the day one talent, they were really getting traction. But when you saw the reality of, oh, wait, by seven to one, a TNA shirt sold and beer money got hot and sold a lot of shirts and a lot of merch for us. But it was always multiples that the TNA brand would sell. And Don would just say, dude, that is that is exactly what they're coming to see. They're TNA fans, not necessarily a wrestler fan. And, and, you know, when we did the rebrand, I, I just wish, oh boy, that, that's another podcast, just how the re- rebrand just completely failed. And look, look at where, look at us right now off the weekend, the, the TNA event and good luck to all those guys. They just named a new CFO. Did you see that this morning, Conrad? Um, I missed anyway. that. Hey, you know yeah. what? Since you brought it up, let's talk about it. You know, all of a sudden there's some interesting stuff going over going on over in TNA and we haven't talked about it here on the program, but it feels like they've got some sort of a partnership or working agreement with WWE. We've seen Jordan Grace and some other folks appearing both ways. I know NXT sent a star over to their pay-per-view this weekend, but at that pay-per-view this weekend, it was a return of not only Matt Hardy, which we got at the last pay-per-view, but now Jeff Hardy's there. So the Hardy boys back together in TNA, along with Dolph Ziggler and Top Dollar and so many others. And now there's even speculation that, Hey, since there is some sort of a working agreement with WWE, could that mean that we would see AJ Styles show up and AJ, when he was asked about it, doing media for the PLE this past weekend was very excited about the idea. And this past weekend, they announced that AJ would actually be working on a Noah show. It's a whole new ball game in WWE. And the idea that you might see AJ Styles back in TNA is amazing. Who would have ever thought that that was possible, you know, under the WWE banner. What do you make of Jeff's return? Jeff Hardy, that is, and the possibility of AJ styles and others back in TNA, that's got to make you feel good, right? Oh, it's just, I guess this happens when you've been around 37, 38 years. You know, when I think back to the attitude era, when it was just the, I mean, the Yankees or the Red Sox. No other team existed. I mean, it was WWF or WCW. I mean, no nothing existed. But yeah, ECW was kind of there and all that. And then it's you know the TNA days. We we, we had a working relationship. You know the the Okada story is obviously a, a part of that. But we had a relationship with New Japan and AAA, and then a little bit with CML. And then you know the the global force didn't take off, but just kind of that whole vision and and and. AEW and the New Japan and and kind of the the Forbidden Door concept and that's coming up at end. But at it, it, the very end of that line, you know, you you look at WWE and now they're working specifically with a Japanese company, another American company. You just kind of look at the world of professional wrestling, and you've got on the one hand a presidential candidate being interviewed by the U S champion. Now, yeah, he's, he's a YouTuber and a big star and all that, but Conrad, you know, that was, uh, Jim talk at my gym, completely non wrestling fans that one conversation led to another. And you just Connie, we're all wrestling fans. But when you look at a Trump doing a podcast to the WWE U S champion, and you look at AJ styles going back to a place that he literally started at. That's that was unheard of a generation ago, just completely unheard of. Matt and Jeff uh, both had, uh, you know, Jeff have how many times he worked for TNA? Two or three times. Matt, I think, two or three times. Those guys there. Uh, who who would ever thought you'd seen Dolph Ziggler 
or Nick Nemeth in a TNA ring. It's just the business has radically changed. I mean, the Netflix deal coming on. I mean, it's just the stuff me and you chatted about before we roll tape that we can't talk about. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it really, it's just changed it, in, in a positive way is what yes. I'm saying. Yes. So I, I love all the feel-good moments. Absolutely, I love it. Hey, let's talk about Sting in this era. But before we do, I want to remind you that, boys, it is getting hot out there. You hear me? I'm talking about hot. Well, thankfully, this is going to be uh, the summer where it doesn't affect you nearly as bad. You know, most of the country is going to be hotter than usual. And Mando whole body deodorant is going to keep you stink free all summer, even in the hottest months. So here are the most important things to know about Mando. You can put it on the whole body. That's right, your whole body. Jeff Jarrett down in Mexico was so hot wrestling outside or being outside in pants and a jacket. He told me before we clicked record, he had to rub the Mando on his butthole. And I said, did you get your bag too? He said, I got all the gimmicks. It's long lasting. It's solid stick and it's invisible cream. And I asked him, which one did you use? And he said, that's a personal question, Connie. But here's what I know. That was on Saturday and Mando works for 72 hours. So he told me he's really putting it to the test. He hasn't showered yet. He's going to be fishing later. Still no shower. Now we're going to get a report from Karen next week and see how well it really works. But the body wash and the cleansing bar are proven to control odor for 24 hours. And I'm telling you, if you use this in combination, it's, uh, it's amazing. You use the body wash to sort of prime your skin in the shower. And then you apply the invisible cream to your whole body. Seriously, wherever you want, you can do your armpits, of course. But everywhere else that, well, you know where you stink. And maybe if you forgot to apply deodorant, you can keep the acidified deodorant wipes in the car and the gym bag to freshen up on the go. And that is a personal favorite of Tony Schiavone's. And this is the talk <laughs> backstage. I'm not kidding around. Jeff, you're laughing. Still so we'll show Jeff on camera right now, but you're laughing. <laughs> but if you see Tony at TV this week, you go over and you say, hey, you got any of those wipes in your bag? And he will go to, you, he will go to the announcer's room open his bag and show you he carries those wipes. He tells me he uses it on his wiener. I mean, he probably uses not very much of the wipe for that part. And then he gets everything else, the whole package, the whole grundle. Like if you're worried about having swamp ass this summer, Mando can help you out. And right now we've got a special offer and I can't wait to tell you about it. But one more time, I want to remind you, this is whole body deodorant. You can use it anywhere. And I mean, anywhere. Yes, your gimmicks, your belly buttons, your butt cracks, your stinky crevices. Maybe you got some rolls. Lord knows I do. You can cover those too. It was created by a doctor, you see. He understood and saw firsthand how BO was just being misdiagnosed and mistreated. This is powerful enough to use on even the strongest stink. We're talking about a Vader level stink, but it can work <laughs> for your wife too. It's aluminum free. It's baking soda free. It's cruelty free. It's dye free. It's vegan. And you're going to be stink free. It's been proven to control odor better than just a shower with soap alone. And right now, we've got a Mando starter pack that is perfect for new customers. Try it. You're going to like it. Your family's going to like it. Your coworkers are going to like it. And that special person in your life who does things every now and again for you in a very intimate way, they're going to be really happy that you found this starter pack. It comes with solid stick deodorant. It comes with cream tube deodorant. And two free products of your choice. I recommend the mini body wash and the deodorant wipes. No kidding. You can even get free shipping. Now we've got a discount code to get you hooked up on your favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market. New customers can get $5 off a starter pack when you use our exclusive code. Now that's like 40% off your starter pack. Go right now and use the code MYWORLD. That's MYWORLD at shopmando.com. That's S H O P. M A N D O dot com. Jeff, tell the truth. How bad do your balls stink right now? Hey, they don't at all. And you know what? If you want, I'll get the queen in here right now and she'll give an update. I want to hear the full on report at the end of the month from, from the queen herself. You, you got me on that one. So we're way past the starter kit. What is that package called? Is it like the advanced, the, the, the V I think I'm at the VIP level of Mondo. Start with the starter kit. Go right now to shopmando.com. Use our promo code, my world. You're going to save like 40% off. It's $5 off at shopmando.com. Seriously. It's summertime. You're going to make your life easier. People are going to be happier with you. You won't be disgusted with yourself. It was so damn humid here this weekend. People were just ill. Let's make sure that we don't get even worse when we go inside and go, 
what the hell died in here? It's you. And it may be your sex life. Go to shopmando.com. Don't smell like Vader. Don't smell like Tony Schiavone's stinky nuts. That's his email. <laughs> Listen, if you're listening to this, send an email right now. I'm not kidding around. Stinky nuts at all elite wrestling.com. It'll go right to Tony Schiavone's inbox. <laughs> and my world is the promo code at shopmando.com. Tony, see you Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about Sting and his retirement. No, I'm not talking about the retirement from 2024. I'm talking about the one you were planning 15 years ago. Meltzer would say they've had these plans every year since he came back. Bound for Glory is being targeted as an idea where they may actually do the retirement. Sting is 50, and every year he says it's his last year, and every year Dixie Carter gives him a good deal and talks him into signing for one more year. There's an internal belief that in the end the same thing will happen this year. But it's noted that the new TV schedule, which means he's doing four days all in a row once a month, since he doesn't do any house shows or foreign tours, that at north of half a million dollars a year, guaranteeing he'll always be on top and probably have time off at least once a year to do an angle, you just can't turn that down. So we know that he didn't retire in 09. He made it all the way to 2024. But did you think you were going to actually get to do the real deal sting retirement at any point in TNA? I never really gave that a, um, and I never gave it a second thought. And the reason why is that retirements, legitimate retirements in wrestling are just so few and far between. I mean, Jackie Fargo came back and drew money in his seventies. Um, you just coming off the heels of triple mania, the, the, I'll call it the legends or the, you know, I don't even want to call them old timers. I'm inching it, you know, but, uh, Dr. Wagner, Cibernetico, uh, obviously vamp at the very top of that list. But when you kind of look at legend Negro Cassis right now, and, and y you know who Negro Cassis is. Yeah. Yeah. Legend. Okay. I didn't even, this is how I'm, I'm not completely dialed in, but psycho clown is his son-in-law. Did not he know that. Yeah. So, so. They're the tag champs and Negro 68. So when you kind of take a step back and my, you asked about, did I ever think I was going to do the retirement match or tour of sting? I really didn't because just how, how the industry is Dutch Mantel's quote, you can't kill a memory and the wrestling fans just, they, they absolutely love it. They, the nostalgia, the box office that's going on south of the border right now with AAA is blowing my mind. I mean, they are doing really, really well across the board. I'm not just talking about ticket sales. I'm talking about corporate uh, sponsorship. And that's how I looked at staying on our roster that, you know, we talked about Midway. I mean, when you walk into a door with Midway and you say, hey, you got Sting and, you know, and, and or Kurt Angle, and you can almost say in others, and you're like, oh, okay, all right, they, they've got a hell of a roster. I, I think about the gigantic box office that AEW did just this year in March. Well, in the wrestling fans' eyes, did they really? Because I know Tanae would occasionally allude to, you know, th is this Sting? Because we kind of poked and prodded. But in a lot of ways, Sting retired in 2024. But that quote-unquote retirement storyline might have started in 08. <laughs> or 09. <laughs> so it's a 15-year storyline. but but. um no, it's uh, I, I never did, and and our schedule fit with Sting, with his personal life, with his family life, and really with his physical, uh, what he wanted to do to give to the business. Because I will say this about Sting, whether it was the Joker or the Icon or whatever version Sting brought to the table, you were going to get a hundred percent of 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 who Steve is, and that's something that I admire greatly to this day. Let's talk about something else you guys were ahead of the curve on, and that is an on-demand subscription service. It's online. It's uh, on the web. I guess we call it video on demand. And they're going to put every pay-per-view event from 2004 to the present available for, for subscribers for just $7.99 a month or $49.99 per year. You could also go choose to watch any full pay-per-view on an individual basis for $3.99. Now, this is years ahead of the WWE Network. We know that that's going to come down, I don't know, like five years after this. But I am curious, 
Did you see what WWE was doing with their 24 seven cable service and think, okay, if we can't get into the cable systems, we'll just do it online. That allows us to go internationally as well. Was that the strategy? Well, for me and I, you know, wearing so many hats, but there are, there were so many times that, and this is, this is just the reality. Conrad, I would go through airports a lot of times headed to Orlando, whatever it may be in 08, 09. And let's say I'm stopped 10 times. I'm just trying to give it a round number. If I'm stopped, obviously they're a fan. Hey, Jeff, you know, if there's five people that say, oh man, China kicked your ass, or you are a great intercontinental champion or slap nuts, WCW run, or you dusty and flair, whatever. And then the other five people say, Hey man, Y'all got a great roster over there. I love that main event mafia. You know, the, 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 the challenge of building a brand and spike as much money as they paid us and as good of partners as they were, we were still scratching and fighting and clawing to get brand exposure. Cause you're, you, I mean, it, we, it was not Coke and Pepsi. It was Coke and RC Cola or it just, it just a, 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 a third tier brand as far as awareness. And so I always was a huge believer. We've got to expose our product to as many people as possible. Can't give it away because when you kind of look at the early days, I think there were some two hour asylum shows that were just freaking awesome, awesome, entertaining shows. I think we laid some duds of course too, but you know, there were some Fox sports shows that were really good shows, but just a small amount of the quote unquote wrestling universe got to see it. Uh, and so monetizing our library, uh, was a big part of it. Going the brand was a big part of it. And also that international component of it that we're going to put this online and, you know, we can, cause they, you know, I can remember kind of one of the presentations is, is that we can put up free content for a limited time to get people to sample us, hopefully convert them to buyers. And just the strategy again, 07, 08, 09, 10, the, the technology was, it, it doesn't even like like our phones doesn't even compare to what it is today, but it was the, the, the infant stages of monetizing content in that manner. We, uh, we got to talk about, uh, some little piece of business. That's not a big deal, but I'm wondering if it makes you think of any famous stories from back in the day, oh you guys had Michael Judas and Phil shatter two big Southeast indie guys who were given I guess, short-term roles, you might say, as new security for Mick Foley. And Judas, whose real name is Michael Cole, no, not that one, he got arrested over the weekend for attacking a promoter named Donovan Loftus in a locker room in Greenville, South Carolina on an indie show. As the story goes, Loftus made some derogatory comments about Cole on a message board, and apparently they were supposed to be made in jest, They'd worked together in the past. And according to the story, Loftus and his son were going into the locker room. He's got his hands full and Cole punches him, knocks him down and kicks him in the head when he's down. And that knocked him out. He gets arrested and posts bail. And now he's got a court date. And I know that most people listening to this, myself included, have no idea who these people are, but I'm just curious. When do you remember there starting to be real life internet heat that resulted in actual fisticuffs in a locker room like this, because these days, respectfully, most of the time, when you see one guy jawing with another in professional wrestling on the interwebs, man, it's all in jest. They're building something they're building towards an angle, but this was 15 years ago. And maybe perhaps people weren't as comfortable with that yet. They weren't really in on the gag. They didn't understand the context. Can you tell, what can you tell us if anything that has happened similar to this that you're familiar with where, Hey, so-and-so said such and such on Twitter. And now I'm going to kick his ass. Cause it just seems crazy to me that that's a real thing. Mm. I wish I'd have been more prepared to this. There's, I guess there's a couple of instances that, that have happened and I don't want to bring that to light in, in AEW. I mean, now there's some online chatter about that in the last couple of years, but I don't remember this specific set of circumstances with, with, uh, can't believe his name, real name is Michael Cole, but, but, uh, uh, and, and Phil Shatter, uh, Chat, uh, Shatter, who that was his NWA name, 
Chad's his real name. I've already forgotten. What was his WWE name? Um, oh my gosh. I can't believe I've already forgot it. But anyway, those two guys, uh, I don't remember that story, but, um, so Conrad online chatter. I mean, back in the day you hear of one wrestler, I think Randy Colley wasn't even working in, in, in the, my dad's territory. And he drove into Jackson, Tennessee to physically confront Dutch over BS, but they came to blows. It's just how the evolution of fisticuffs, um, that's a podcast in and of itself. Um, you know, the savage stories back in the day, they're going to fight in the Waffle House fights, but online chatter that created, um, man, Conrad, what are some good ones? I'm sure they're, can you think of any? I can't off might- the top of my head. I was wondering, you know, I, I know that we've heard, I mean, I know that we're not supposed to talk about it, but I know there was a dust up not too long ago in AEW and there resulted in a whole bunch of mess, but that was set at a press conference and not online. And I didn't know if back then people would say, Hey, so-and-so saying this on the internet. I mean, like years ago, I saw an interview with Buff Bagwell where he said, my career was ruined by the computer. And I was like, what? But his context was, well, that's what people are saying online that Jim Ross said that my mother called and blah, blah, blah. And we've debunked all that at adfreeshows.com. But still, I, I was curious if it ever actually led to violence like this, because the idea that, man, this guy said something on a message board. And as soon as he comes in with his hands full and there's a kid there, I'm going to sucker punch his ass. And when he's down, his I'm going to get right. The promoter's kid. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Like I mean, just uh, over a message board comment, then I, it's just hard for me to imagine. Hey, I, I want to mention, cause I know you're a, 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 a nut like I am. As you and I are recording this today, uh, thank you guys for listening on June 18th. But on June 17th, 1985, the Macho Man Randy Savage made his WWF debut in Poughkeepsie, New York. So today is the anniversary of 85, Jeff. How crazy is that to think about? That's unbelievable. On this day, 1985. We, uh, we should talk a little bit about TNA Slammiversary. Here we are. What a great reviewed show this is. If you didn't watch Slammiversary 09 and you're looking for something fun to watch, I want to recommend it. TNA has a great streaming service. You can see it on YouTube and anywhere that you enjoy TNA. TNA Slammiversary 2009. Check this out. 0% thumbs in the middle. Only 9.4% thumbs down and an overwhelming 90.6% thumbs up. And for all the criticism, because I've heard so many people online and in my real life, my wrestling friends, who would tell me, oh, the King of the Mountain match is just stupid. Well, the X Division one, it won the match of the night. And the Heavyweight King of the Mountain match, it came in second. Now, the worst match polls, well, it was the ladies, but whatever. The idea that the King of the Mountain match has been criticized and kicked I want you to just briefly explain to some of our listeners who may not be familiar with the concept, what is the King of the Mountain match? And then I want you to answer, if you can, why do you think people are so critical of the concept? Um, I almost want to, yeah, I, I guess I should give the steps and that it's a reverse ladder match. It's obviously for a title and you have to climb the ladder and hang the belt as opposed to climb the ladder and grab the belt off. You climb the batter, climb the ladder and hang the belt. In order to be able to qualify, five guys start, you've got to get a pinfall. You got to pin one of the one of your four opponents, and that makes you eligible. I was looking for that word, eligible to, to win the match. And if you do end up taking a fall or get pinned, you get put in the penalty box for two minutes. So to me, it's pretty damn simple. And I have witnessed many of these. And the, the 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 vibe in the arena as the match and drama build to me is a lot of the magic of it. And uh, the I don't know that wasn't the second one we had. We did one where we screwed Christian out of the title. People were it was, anyway. We've had some really it's good storytelling. Um, why is it criticized? I I'll, in my opinion, I think and. Didn't WWE just bring back some kind of variation or, or something like this? I just think a narrative gets start. We just talked about the online. Like that guy jumped another guy, and I would be willing to bet that that uh, Michael Cole, not the announcer, but but uh, Judas, Michael Judas. I bet he didn't read the 
uh, message board until somebody tipped him off about it. So it's that narrative getting, he said, she said, and built and this and that, and this and that. The reality is the, 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 the very small sample of these thumbs up or thumbs down. I think it totals in this particular pay-per-view a hundred. So I don't know, even if it did 30,000 buys or 40,000 or 20,000, that fraction or percentage of thumbs up, thumbs down, is it really reflective? I don't know. I'm not here to debate that, but the narrative on the King of the Mountain match came out pretty quick of, oh, that's too hard to understand. And I'm thinking, A, have you watched even one of them? And B, if you did watch it, tell me why it was hard to understand because I was very open and very candid in the creative rooms before we ever had the first one. It was my concept and the thought process. I was like, okay, how to poke holes in this and this and that. And the decision and and the debate that we had going into this show, Conrad, in the creative rooms are, hey, Jeff, don't put two on there. Don't put two on there. I'm like, I hear you, but it's Slammiversary. We've only had one for the last couple of years. How do we make this special? We definitely have to give the heavyweights uh, a much heavier story. It's got to be storyline driven. You have AJ Styles in the match, which takes things to a whole nother level. But that um, X Division King of the Mountain match, it was, it was just so damn good. And those guys, the high flyers, they bring a different element to this match than than the heavyweights. But um, I think to, to wrap it up, I just think once the narrative got started, it was much like. TNA LOL mm. that they just, that there was a lot of buy-in to, Oh, it's a little bit bad. It's all bad, which, you know, uh, you, you look at, I mean, that's off to those guys. What, what is their year 22? Uh, it's still going. It, it's kind of amazing. to me. Is it true? Now this is a, a personal question. Can I ask you a personal question here on the program? Oh, are you going to talk about my, uh, private parts? Deodorant and all that. No, I'm, I'm not going to talk about deodorant. No, we're done with that. Okay. We're not uh, going to talk about Casio's issues. No, nope, no more doo doo talk. I, okay. I, I want to ask you back in your simply irresistible days. Oh, so, this is when you're a young buck in the wrestling business. You're in your very early 20s. You're not married yet. You don't have a, you know, uh, you're not a television, national television wrestler just yet, but. Boy, you're making towns and you're over like we're over and you're getting all your picture money. You got your car like you like it. You're in great shape. You're putting on the muscle. I imagine that there were probably some benefits to being a young, handsome, good-looking, in-shape guy on the local television coming to your town. And I imagine that maybe you invented the king of the ladder match or the, the king of the mountain match in a hotel room thanks to our friends called Blue Chew. That's right. What they would do is they'd have to run up and try to hang the belt around something to Jeff's. And he had to make sure they had something sturdy to hold on to. And thanks to Blue Chew, we can make that happen. You see, Blue Chew is a unique online service that gets Jeff Jarrett's ding dong simply irresistible. It's like 1986 level hard because it's got the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime. So you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Think of Blue Chew as like a hot tag for your wiener. You sign up at BlueChew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within a few days. And the best part, it's all done online. So that means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But if you're looking to hit your finish, if you're looking to go two out of three falls, if you're looking for no holds barred, if you're looking to hit her with the stroke and another stroke and another stroke, bluechew.com can help. Bluechew wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And Jeff Jarrett was telling me before we clicked record today, he used an old Southern phrase. He said, Connie got me so hard the other day, even a cat couldn't scratch it. Now I'm not really sure what that means, but I think it's a good thing. Let's find out for sure right now, because we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try blue chew free. When you use our promo code, my world at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is my world and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. 
And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Hey, real question. Have you ever had a conversation with Satnam Singh about Blue Chew? <laughs> hey, um, I, I bet he'd put a few folks in the penalty box. <laughs> I mean, I feel like if, if he were to discover, if Satnam Singh were to discover Blue Chew, I feel like there'd be paperwork involved. Well, afterwards. he'd be the king of the mountain for sure. <laughs> <laughs> One in a billion. Uh, feel like that yourself at my world. Use that uh, promo code MYWORLD at BlueChew.com. Hey, let's talk about the show. We've got uh, what looks like six or 7,000 people in the building. Your production team, Keith Mitchell, was working overtime, and this thing looked huge, and they're super hot, and they're loving old stars like Sting and Foley, but they're also loving the quote-unquote homegrown talent like AJ Styles and Beer Money. They're also into the machine guns and Rhino because, well, we're in their backyard. I mean, we're not too far from Detroit here. But Meltzer would say it's more of an illusion. The tickets were only $7 for general admission because it's a big building. And there's still only 2,200 paid. And there's about 1,800 comps. So while there's 4,000 people there, only about half of those are, are, are paying customers. And the cheap seats are just $7. But as a television presentation, it looked awesome. I mean, is that more important? I mean, I suppose for pay-per-view, it's like, who cares about the gate? We're making the money on the pay-per-view sales. Was that the attitude back then? You know, what we, I can't say landed on, but Auburn Hills is a suburb. It is not Detroit. It's north. Um, and getting people out there was a little bit more challenging. Obviously, the, the Pontiac Silverdome had been gone. and all that kind of stuff. But, um, the $7 for the seven anniversary, that was a promotional deal that, man, I just not disputing those numbers. Don't feel right. Uh, but yes, pay-per-view audience is what you're going for on this. Again, like I said, the building wanted us, we got a fantastic deal, uh, period going into it. Uh, but yeah, 2,200 paid. That's, I, I wish they'd been a little bit more, but, uh, you said it. Pay for your audience. What we were, what we were, laser focused on. It's just crazy to me that even on a show like this, it's written that you guys only had a walk up of like one fifty, and you got Sting and Foley and so many names on here. It's a real head scratcher. Uh, by the way, I should mention that we have got uh, a pretty great show here. We hmm. should uh, go ahead and start with some of the matches here. We've got Suicide retaining the X title in a King of the Mountain match. This is going to win match of the night. So it's not just Suicide. It's Jay Lethal. It's Consequences Creed, who we know these days as Xavier Woods, Chris Saban, and Alex Shelley. This is a big deal. You've got one of the Detroit Tigers out there as the celebrity holding the belt. Um, when you see what these X Division guys do with your idea for this King of the Mountain match, how impressed are you? I mean, it gets three and a quarter, three and three quarter stars. People just love this match. I mean, there's crazy hot spots and they're doing stuff that respectfully, you just don't normally see in a heavyweight version of this. I mean, these guys are the X division. Right. What, what, what do you think of, of their version of the King of the mountain? Man? Just, and, and look, who was a suicide this night? Was it Kazarian? I thought, I thought it was Daniels, but it might've been because it could have been. Yeah. You know what? Because I was looking at that match and going, okay. No, 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 no. That's Kazarian. That's Kazarian. I misspoke because I, I was thinking Daniels cause he's in the next match. So this is Kazarian. I think it's, I think it's, but, um, like who's going to be the QB and Frankie's so damn good, but you know, Jay, we already talked about just the, the, the chemistry of those guys, but put next division guys in the King of the Mount match. It, it's, when you said, how does it make you feel? Well, I, I could remember a couple of times watching the ultimate X matches and just like thinking about how these guys it's, I don't want to call it video game wrestling, but they have a little bit different melody, uh, uh, a method and a madness and, and the creative thought process that went into it. I, I knew, um, the reaction and, and, and watching some of it that night. Uh, I remember we watched this match back at the offices. Um, either a week later or something like, like that. Cause I kind of wanted to watch, uh, it all put together. Um, they're just, is, is damn good. And going back to, oh man, you don't understand it. It's super easy to understand. Um, when you, when you really watch it and sit down and again, uh, Motor City Machine Guns being in it, uh, they were the hometown favorites. Um, 
you know, who would have thought suicide would have been the quote unquote, the heel in it. But when you look at the other four guys in it, you go, okay, I, I can kind of see that because the, the suicide character being in the video game and he, he, he had a good aura and a buzz around him. So those five guys, there wasn't a, 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 a true heel or baby face mindset. Uh, but, Again, they tore they tore the house down. Go back and watch it. Let's talk. Yeah, go out of your way to see this one. It's a fantastic match. I do want to ask you about Kazarian though, because in wrestling, I've met a lot of fun people, but he's one of the most nice, polite, genuine human beings. Just a great dude. And then the bell rings, and he's an incredible wrestler. And I've had this conversation with some of my other podcasts that you know, and we talk about this a lot in business, but certainly in entertainment and wrestling as well. Timing is everything. I think if a guy like crit like like Frankie Kazarian came along today, man, people would just be losing their mind. I think he was uh, a victim of bad timing and he's still going by the way, but I'm just saying, I think if he was first breaking out now, I think the industry at large is, is more prepared for a talent like that because that guy just flew under the radar for a lot of wrestling fans for a long time, but his work was great. Then it's great. Now, I mean, he's one of those just rock solid performers that, Man, in a different time, in a different place, and if you reshuffle the deck, he could very easily be one of the top guys uh, in a big way. And I know he's doing great in TNA. I'm not negative about that. I'm just saying I think in an alternate universe, he could be a major WWE superstar. Well, I, I completely agree. And, you know, being from Music City and you look at, and I, again, I've, I, from an entertainment aspect or music aspect, I've always tried to be somewhat a student of the game. And you look at the highwayman, I'm dating myself here, but Johnny Cash, Willie Jennings, Willie, Chris Christopherson, and they'll all talk about their first break and how they got it and this song and that song. But they always land back on, on kind of the timing of things. And then you look at, they called them, quote unquote, the hat acts, Clint Black, Garth Brooks. Uh, uh, there was four or five others, uh, Toby, uh, you, you know, but, but you kind of look at the timing of everybody and Toby took his music and bet on himself and went out, but the timing of all that was perfect. I mean, you look at Taylor Swift, she came to town country was looking for a little something different. Here's this young girl who could write her ass off, but just connected with the audience. Same thing you do with wrestling. I think at times Conrad I've had in my own career kind of good timing. And then on the other hand, sign up some, some bad timing. It's just kind of how the, the, the nature of the beast, but at the end of the time, we're talking about Frankie staying power. He's still around, but I think you are absolutely spot on that times of his career, uh, specifically at TNA, it was, there was, you know, we had AJ at the top and, uh, you know, there's, there's only one top guy in that X division. Then Joe came along and the undefeated streak an exhibition wrestler. Well, yeah, but no, we're going to move him over here. Timing is everything in, in your ascent to the top of the card. Timing is everything. Take that with you today, folks. Let's talk about the next match. We've got Christopher Daniels, Shane Douglas in eight minutes and 12 seconds. Of course, Shane has uh, come back on television a few weeks prior and, uh, interfered in a match and assaulted, uh, Daniels with the chain that sets up this match. And I guess the animosity is, is building up the show here. It gets a two star rating. It's the best moonsault ever for the pin. He's another one of those criminally underrated guys. You know, we've heard that, oh, he was supposed to be the higher power with WWE way back in 1999. Well, here we are 10 years later and he's working with Shane Douglas and having a great match. what do you think of the, the best moonsault ever? It's fantastic. And you know, I can remember. I'll call them the creative debates because, um, all right, we're going to bring Shane Douglas. That's the flavor of the, uh, the nostalgia. Although we were seven years old, how do we do some throwbacks? Well, what are we going to do with them? Oh, well, no, we can't bring them back and put them over because they're not here the next week. And I, on the one hand, in one creative session, I would say, well, why not? Why, why, why can't we not? have a feel good moment for our audience and put them over. And then probably the next creative session, I was like, yeah, there's no real upside. We need to put our, our homegrown talent over just kind of the debate and the yin and the yang of it. And does at the end of the day, do, do the wins and losses really matter in this setting? 
But, um, you know, we obviously ended up all voting on, yeah, Daniels needs to get, go over and his finish. Um, it's one of those things that, that God, the amount of times Chris has done that finish and he does it damn near perfect every time hats off to the guy. Uh, but, but it was, um, you know, that this was a good car top to bottom and a single following that X division match was not easy and they did it. Next up, we've got a hell of a match between Angelina Love and Tara. I say a hell of a match because if this was on TV, millions of people would have watched it. But when we asked the dirt sheet writers what they thought of it, it gets half a star. Uh, and listen, let's be honest about why we're here. And again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm saying this is what it was. Angelina's going to come out wearing a top with uh, <clears throat> words on her chest. I'll just say that. That says weapons of mass seduction. I mean, listen, that's what we're leaning for. That's what we're going for. And we got it. Sky's going to spray Tara with the hairspray. Love wins with the downward spiral. And then we get a spectacle. And boy, what a spectacle it is. It's Abyss and Taylor Wilde taking on Raven and Daphne in a Monsters Ball match. Yes, a mixed tag Monsters Ball. Hello, Palace of Auburn Hills. They go 14 minutes and 7 seconds. It is at your standard weapons match. But still, with the ladies involved. We're even going to box Daphne's ears with garbage can lids. I mean, Daphne was a, a superstar for you guys. I know people are going to laugh when I say that, but she's doing dominant ratings. Seriously, great ratings here. Every time she's on, ratings go up. And Meltzer and everybody was trying to speculate, hey, why is that? And Meltzer would even write in this particular episode of the, or issue of The Observer that perhaps it's because, and the theory he keeps hearing, is that maybe some of the WWE do, uh, divas seem unattainable to the male audience, but Daphne feels like, hey, that's a girl that I could relate to, and she might actually talk to me, and she's she's very attractive, very, very good-looking lady, but attainable. And I thought that was just crazy that we're even having that sort of conversation in, a, in the newsletter. But he's looking for a way to explain what is her appeal? Why is she doing so much better? And whenever I see people heaping praise on Daphne, in 2024, it makes me sad because we know that, well, her story did not have a happy ending, but I hope that, you know, people who are in a similar headspace will, you know, get the help they need and, and, and find out that, Hey, you know what? Uh, the sun will come up tomorrow and it can get better and life is hard, but goodness gracious. When I think about Daphne, I just think about lost opportunity because she was great in WCW. She was great in TNA and it seems like she really, really loved it. If we do nothing else talking about this match, I'd love to hear you just heap some praise on Daphne because I just thought the world of her character and her performance. And really, I mean, it's not like she, you know, was trained by Luthez to wrestle. She just no. loved it and was getting after it. And people really responded to her. And that's where you never know. And yeah, to, to, to mention her passing that way, very respectful. Um, you just never know what goes on. That's uh, right. In, in someone's mind because. You know, she didn't come in as, as our boy Jr. would say, a blue chipper. She didn't have, whether it's a fantastic athletic background or trained by here or this fantastic independent run or whatever. She came on the scene, WCW, just like out of nowhere and, and had to learn trial by era really in front of everybody. But, but when you go back and watch, and I, I got a, he, a little praise on Abyss. And Raven because they were they knew how to put these matches together. But Taylor and and Daphne just to me were the the fancy salts of this that just took it to another level. But back to the the appeal statement you said, and and I'll give Dave he's kind of spot on. And and when my dad used to talk to different talent, that I would hear him in these conversations, and and he would uh, about drawing money and 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 uh, back to. Uh, how do you mostly connect? That was what he said his entire calling card was. He never had a body. He didn't want to work out, but you know, he he never was a muscle up guy. He, he he wasn't a hollering and screamer in his promos. He rarely raised his voice. It just wasn't his style. But you know, and he would say, Yeah, some people call me the boy next door, but but that 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 is just kind of part of the appeal. It is how can people watching you on TV say, I connect with her? And Daphne had that because she, she, you know, she didn't her her look and and had a 
maybe a little crazy streak as far as, uh, you know, and that comes from her WCW days, but she just had a, a personality makeup that made for box office that people just liked her. It, it was just, and, and, and in our wacky world of professional wrestling, a girl who's willing to take a few crazy bumps here and there, it endears them to that, to, to, to the fan base. And I just thought in a lot of ways, her in abyss and Raven and, and Taylor was kind of the odd man out. But for this match, they all just fit. And the people go out of your way, folks, to watch this. I remember, like I said, watching it at Comic Station, watching the match back or what the entire show back. Cause uh in our uh, our lobby, we always would run the the pay-per-view uh during the day when people come in. But we we watched and and j- just the chemistry that they all had, it was is special is good. God bless her. Such an outstanding person. Everybody I know who knew her in real life. I never had the pleasure of meeting her, man. They just loved her. The match gets three and a quarter stars, but I think you should go out of your way to see it. Finish is going to see abyss. Use the black hole slam on Raven into the thumbtacks. Raven's not booked for TV right after this. So maybe they're thinking this is going to be his uh, swan song for a bit. Was there any pushback or hesitation from Dixie? about doing a monsters ball max with a mixed tag with the ladies in there. No, I mean, she, she totally understood that. And, you know, when, when you look at the, the, the totality of it, because on the one hand, and again, she was a part of these discussions, like, are we going to bring back? It was Shane Douglas and Raven and we beat both of them. And like, why are we bringing them back? If we're going to beat them. Well, there's a kind of a flavor for the nostalgia. This is slam anniversary seven. We are celebrating you know, the, the history of the, uh, of the promotion. Uh, but you know, both of them did fantastic jobs and I think elevated the show. Let's talk about the next match. It is a big one. We got sting and Matt Morgan, and, uh, it's mostly going to be Morgan beating on sting. Of course, at the end, we know Sting's going to get the win in eight minutes and 59. Uh, he's going to use an enziguri and then put Morgan in the scorpion Deathlock. Morgan's going to power out. Like it's nothing it's supposed to be a big spot, but it doesn't seem to really register with the crowd. Morgan's going to miss another charge in the corner. Sting uses the death drop off the middle rope, and that gets it done. Star in three quarters. Matt Morgan is one of those great what ifs to me. I know that uh, Jim Cornette was really high on him. I mean, the guy looks like a superstar. He can talk. He's giant. He can he can wrestle. He's super likable. He's personable. I'm not saying he's the strongest promo in the world, but I just thought, man, there's enough here that even if we need to put a mouthpiece with him. This guy can be a megastar, but it feels like for whatever reason, fans just never really got behind him. Uh, Can you put your finger on that as to why maybe? I can't other than back to our set of circumstances of timing. He was never made. He was made a priority, not the priority. And I think for a 6'10 guy, um, you, you gotta, gotta have a lot of focus. They're not just physically. They're not just another guy. So from a creative perspective, perspective if you if you treat them like just another guy they're they're super easy i say this respectfully because in the creative rooms i've been in there you you end up saying oh shit they're lost in the shuffle and that just happens not by anything they did wrong it just happens and it may have been because even in this match there's a pretty significant i don't like the word but the internet calls it a botch We've got Matt Morgan set up, uh, setting Sting up for the what he called the elevator, and Sting was going to reverse it into a scorpion death drop, and it was supposed to be a near fall. So it's not the finish, but when he hits it right there, reversing that elevator, you would think, oh, that's the finish. But they both fall in the process. So it doesn't happen the way it's supposed to, and I get that that would just take the crowd out of it. But yep. as you said a minute ago, timing's everything. You you have a few of those things happen and maybe fans start to lose a little bit of confidence and it takes them out oh. of you. I mean, it just, it ruins the tempo of the match, if nothing else. And now you got to work to get them back. Right, Jeff? Yeah. I mean, I, I think something happened over this weekend with Drew and Damien. Uh, the timing of, and I don't like the word either botches, but mishaps that, that just through the years, I mean, the most famous one is Shockmaster. It, it's like the presentation of, of a new character and the build up that could not have come at a worse time for the shock master. Now there's d- varying degrees. Cause that was his debut, but yeah. Um, the timing of your botches 
God bless all of us. We hope they're not at a quote unquote critical point. Yeah. Critical point. Well, and here's the thing about the reason I don't like the word botch. It's supposed to be a real fight. Yes. Now I know that we all know what it is, but like in a real fight, nothing ever looks smooth. It's not supposed to look like Cirque du Soleil. Like, you know, it, go watch a UFC and when guys are trying to pull things off, sometimes they just stumble and fall because that's what a real fight looks like. But when we see it in wrestling, we're like, oh, that's a botch. And it's like, okay, you want choreography? You want synchronized swimming? Uh, uh, I mean, are you sure you're not playing the role of Jerry Jarrett today? Cause I have heard him raise his voice <laughs> respectfully in the dressing room about, oh my God, I just screwed that spot up and this and that. My dad would just, in his, in his controlled way, kind of lose it. Like what the F are you talking about? You're the problem that you think that no, you didn't. You, you just missed. Now I hate the heel. And like, it, it, cause there was a spot. What was that guy's name? It doesn't matter. They did, uh, whatever tackle drop down. I'm going to hit you with two drop kicks. Okay. And the baby face, the young guy, the first drop kick connected and he came up rushing and maybe the heel was rushing him and threw a drop kick. And I mean, he missed and the other heel season didn't go down. He just kind of brushed it off and they kept going with the spot. Well, the young kid came through the curtain was apologetic and oh my God, I screwed that whole spot. And then they were like, no, you didn't. It happens. <laughs> it happens. That had been a, a bad deal. If the guy would have taken bump off of air, but those little things like you're right, Conrad, we call them a botch because of we're too, we're too smart for our own good. Like we know what it was supposed to look like, but in a real fight, if we remember what this is really supposed to be, there's no such thing as a botch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, let's talk about the tag team title match because boy, this is one of my favorite. I don't know why I love this, but I do for years and years. I used to bust our, our mutual friends, uh, balls, Mr. Dave Milliken. I would ask him always in mixed company. Whenever we had a new wrestling friend with us, I would say, Hey man, in your opinion, who's the greatest tag team of all time. And why is it the Dudley boy? Because Dave was not a big ECW guy. So he was like, I don't get how they're the best tag team. They're not better than the midnights. They're not better than the rock and rolls. They're not better than Arn and Tully. And he'd rattle off a list and it would always tickle me. So I would just keep doing it. Who's the best tag team of all time. And why is it the Dudley boys? But I love their act. I love their characters. I thought their matches were fun. And, and I get if you're watching at home and you weren't really an ECW guy, you might not have been into it. But if you were in the building and you experienced it live, it's fun. And so was beer money. And that's what we got here. These guys got plenty of time, 16 minutes and 55 seconds. And they're pushing really hard on the program. The Team 3D was flying in from Osaka. They had a four-hour layover in Tokyo before flying straight into Detroit. And they're saying that over and over and over, of course, Maybe if you're paying attention, you know, that's some foreshadowing beer money, become the tag team champs, 16 minutes and 55 seconds. Fans are loving this. They're chanting. We want tables right away. Um, what did you think? I mean, I, I know there's some shenanigans. We got Rob Terry and we got Doug Williams and, and all that jazz, but it's a three and a quarter star match. And Meltzer would say it was a good match, but nothing compared to their match in Philadelphia. But beer money and team 3D, that's about as good as it's going to get for tag team wrestling here in 09, no? And you just said the best best tag team, you know, uh, and it was no secret that they had their ECW run yes. and they had their WWF run. And James Storm had been with America's Most Wanted, Chris Harris, a partner, and so he had been a single guy. Bobby Roode had been Team Canada, so and both were homegrown guys, and they had kind of moved along. Then Bobby went out uh, on his singer's career and James was on his singer's career. And we were just, things organically fell into place and the cowboy and, and the rich Canadian and, and everything. And when you, we put them together and that common slang term, uh, beer money, just kind of the magic happened. And the TNA faithful fans, they wanted to believe that's their guys and no, they're the best tag team. So those guys, in a lot of ways, had a built-in kind of program. And look, Bubba at this time and, and Devon, they were hard-charging and were proud. And they were legit New Japan tag champs. And so they brought an international flair. They had chemistry. All four guys would bust their ass. 
Uh, they were hungry. They were selfish in the right way on getting their stuff up over. It was, it was one of the best, I think, kind of box office attraction tag uh, feuds that, that the company ever had. I love this match. I wish you'd go watch it. And now let's take a look at our main event. It's the King of the Mountain match, and man, it's loaded. Remember now, Samoa Joe is working here with a torn tricep. He still works the match, and he is hurting something serious. Kurt Angle's going to get the win, though, in a match with Mick Foley, as well as Jeff Jarrett, Samoa Joe, and AJ Styles. And the story here is that Samoa Joe is turning heel. He seemingly has the thing won. And he's just going to hand the belt to Kurt. Sting had no idea this was happening. It's a big Russo-like swerve is the way it's described here. But um, Angle's got a new look, too. He doesn't just show up looking like Kurt Angle. He's letting his hair grow out a little bit. And he's got a beard going. And Meltzer would say he actually looks like his old mentor, David Schultz, the 80s gold medalist. And I wanted to know, what do you remember of this match? What can you tell us about this? How do you come up with the finish? I mean, coming into this with one of your top stars, a critical player in the match with a torn tricep, and one of your other stars has a totally new look, this is um, interesting. And you got legends in there, like Sting and Foley, who respectfully may need, or not Sting and Foley, but Foley maybe needs a little bit of help. And you're so, in there holding yeah. it all together with AJ. To me, AJ Foley. Joe and Kurt. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kurt yeah, wins yeah. the thing. Yeah. Kurt, well, yeah. Uh, but just the dynamic of all of us, I thought made compelling TV because there was a lot of yin and yang a, a, across the board. Um, but Kurt, I think, was doing or preparing for a movie. That's right. Or there, there, there were some things going on outside of in his uh, career, not all that, but the story. And yes, uh, just the, I'll call it the main event mafia, Russo, Mantel, Jarrett. We were just weaving stories in and out. And, and for lack of a better word, it was, it was creative, which is subjective. And we knew that, okay, not everybody's going to, I mean, there's going to be, it's going to be a mixed bag, but we're going to tell our story and they're not going to be disappointed with Kurt being champion. Uh, but, I, I just, I got to point out having AJ styles in these, this specific kind of match, he's great next division. I mean, um, ultimate X matches. He's great in ladder matches, obviously singles and three ways and all that on this uh, episode, we didn't dive in. They did a three way out on that West coast swing. Uh, there was a fantastic match. I can remember the people just going absolutely bananas for it. Uh, cause it was a surprise live event match. But having AJ in, in in this match specifically, it just always took the match to another level because AJ could cause a, a guy to to take a fall and be put in the penalty box. Just AJ, I always looked at these matches, and I don't know how many while I was there, either AJ in it or Abyss or both. They were really a big part of the glue of these matches. AJ on this night, I mean, in so many ways, MVP. I mean, still going to still great. Go out of your way to see it. It was the second best match of the night. And, you know, they're using lots of fun stuff with uh, the penalty kick. I mean, the, the penalty box, and it's a nice way to cover up some injuries or, or things like that. But ultimately we've got, um, Joe doing a Masawa elbow suicida onto Foley and Jared on the floor takes everybody out. Styles give gives angles a uh, Styles clash. He got, starts climbing and Joe runs in. Power bombs AJ off the ladder. Joe starts climbing, holding the belt, and then Angle comes up after him. And Joe just hands Angle the belt and he wins. And the show goes off the air with Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash, Booker T, and Charmel. Uh, they're all together here celebrating, but not Sting. And Meltzer would say the spots were better than the whole of the match, but it reads better than it actually was watching it. If you're into swerves that make no sense when you look back, then this was a great finish. Otherwise, you finish the show with the idea that nothing makes sense or matters. Between as much as Joe did while injured, Foley doing that elbow, and all the stuff Angle did at his age with his injuries, all coming just days after the Masawa death, 
you realize the drive to perform in these guys is to lead to the tragedies that were always a major part of the business. Three stars. I, um, I don't know how to comment on the Masawa death, but goodness gracious, the swerve for the sake of a swerve. I mean, I know you needed a, an excuse to explain away some of the, the injury stuff, but were you happy with the creative at the time? I mean, how far in advance did you guys land on that? Oh, wow. And, and, and that's why people, our band, Dave, just because he says a serve, it's a swerve for the sake of a swerve for him. And, and I think at the end of the day, Dave has like all of us, a subjective opinion on storylines. Sometimes he don't like them. Sometimes they may go too deep. Maybe he never can land on why he doesn't actually land on it. But if you look at Sting and Kurt were the leaders, uh, or Kurt was the leader of the main event mafia, but Sting's that icon. So there was always that kind of mutual respect. Respect. If you you remember, folks, we did an empty arena match, and they were coming to blows. And so, in a lot of ways, all right, who's going to be the newest member of the mafia? Well. In the mafia days, if you want to lean into the, you got to kind of prove your worth. So what is proving your worth? And Joe had been a former champion and just how are we going to get to the next step? And so it, it may be a little too intricate. It may be too much story. Maybe is it illogical? Like you said, Hey, we're supposed to be simulating a fight. And in a real fight, would you do that? There's a thousand ways you could rationalize, justify or minimize the wrestling logic, but at the end of the day, it's a story and uh, a subjective story. It got us exactly Conrad where we wanted it to go. Uh, was it a hundred percent right or hundred percent wrong? No, it's all that gray area. I, uh, I really enjoyed the show. I don't know that, um, I've never been a huge fan of swerves, but I understand, you know, circumstances dictate that sometimes. Uh, uh, no, wait a minute. Have you not really been a huge fan of swerves? I mean, there, I, uh, some of them, but I feel like okay. it's overdone. Oh, yeah. Oh, like, no. like, like well, the idea that. is like, is it a swerve? If you see a swerve, like if you saw a swerve once a year, it'd be awesome. When you see one once a month, you just get conditioned for it. And I feel like it's become a tired wrestling trope where now we know when there's something happening, we just, it becomes predictable. So you'll see when you're watching on TV, the whole crowd just starts looking at the ring entrance or the, the ramp, like, okay, who's going to run in? Because so we just conditioned that. And like when I was watching on TV during the Vince McMahon era, I knew when the match is happening in the ring and someone gets thrown to the outside, oh, they're going to commercial. I mean, immediately when they get thrown out, I would say to whoever I'm watching, I'm going to fast forward through the commercial. What commercial? Well, the one that's coming right now because they just do it so repetitively. And I think the swerve, I'm just looking for swerves everywhere now. I'm not allowed to just assume it is what I see. I'm just always like, well, there's going to be a swerve. So let me ask you this. The Celtics and the Mavericks. I know you're not an NBA judge. No, I'm watching. Yeah. Finals, right? Yeah. And 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 I think they Boston going up 3-0. Yep. I mean in dominant fashion. Like in the words of my partner, O'Connor, I mean, they're taking those boys to the woodshed. Yes. And they're making them like this ass whooping. Yes. Okay. To me, that's a swerve. A 3 0. I don't think anybody saw this coming. No. Make the diehard boss. Okay. Well, guess what? Connie, I'm not a real big fan of this swerve. It sucks. It's boring. It's no fun. It's it's bad TV. It's channel changing. I turned the game off in the third quarter. Blah, blah, blah. So I guess what I'm saying is in all of sports, I mean, Tennessee Friday night, you talk about a hell, hell, they did a walk. I mean, it was an incredible swerve. Nobody saw them getting four straight hits in the bottom of the ninth to come back and win the game. Right. That's a hell of a swerve. So we enjoyed that swerve, but this boring ass three, you know what I'm saying? So Swerves happen in all of the sports. I think it's subjective in how you look at it. So I'm with you. We are conditioned to look up the ramp or going outside the ring. I think all of wrestling is a swerve. It's just goes back to what makes a number one hit. Is it the song that's well-written or the singer? 
Well, we both, or I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I believe it absolutely is both of them, but it's that, it, that, that, that talent has to really be emotionally connected. So I think when you don't like swerves, you might not be emotionally connected to the talent. And I'm not saying that's the end all be all, but it's a good, I mean, we wrestling fans could talk about this over and over and over. So. Well, and we're going to talk about it again next week. I love uh, picking your brain here every single week. Before we get out of here, I want to remind everybody that in my real life, I'm helping people save money, and I do it over at SaveWithConrad.com. As a matter of fact, earlier today, we got a review from Columbus, Ohio. It's five stars, I'll have you know. And uh, here's what old Douglas said. I can't say enough about the experience. It was near perfect. Diane was absolutely amazing. Her communication was amazing. Answered every question I had, and there were a lot in the quickest manner every time. She couldn't have made the process better or more simple. Folks, if you're looking to save money, look no further than SaveWithConrad.com. You've got a friend in the mortgage business. That's me. And at SaveWithConrad.com, we don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. Because you don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. I want to answer your questions about credit, about home ownership, about how much of a down payment you need. Maybe you've never bought a house before. We can hold your hand and walk you through that whole process. We want to make it easy for you to get out of that apartment and get into that house. And maybe you're already in your house, but you, whenever you have people over, you say, now one day we're going to do this. And someday we're going to do that. Talking about upgrading kitchens or bathrooms or flooring, or maybe a man cave or a pool. Well, I can get you the cash you need to turn your house into your dream home with no money out of pocket. We're routinely helping people do that over at SaveWithConrad.com. You can even consolidate all of your debt into one low monthly payment. Recently, we helped a family save more than $1,000 a month. That's right. They saved $1,000 a month. They didn't save $1,000 one time. They saved $1,000 this month. They'll save $1,000 next month. How much can you save? Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. That's SaveWithConrad.com. In MLS number 32416. Jeff, I had a lot of fun talking to you today, and uh, I don't know if you know this, but next week, or I guess it's uh, a little more than that now. I know it's next week, yeah. We're nine days out from a live watch-along over at adfreeshows.com. I'm oh, going to yeah. be catching up with our old pal JBL, John Bradshaw Layfield. Now, hear me out. I know some mm. of you who hear that, you have decided that you don't like JBL. Well, let me remind you, once upon a time, you decided you didn't like Jeff Jarrett either. And now this is your favorite podcast. You're going to get to talk to the real John Bradshaw Layfield next week. And he might actually go into character mode for us and we can have some fun. It's all happening at adfreeshows.com because we're doing on the exact anniversary, 20, year, 20 years to the day, we're going to watch him and Eddie Guerrero tear it up at the Great American Bash. The idea of this character coming out and cutting all these promos and just doing a real 180 with the way he had been presented. We're going to talk about that. We're going to get some context. And then we're going to watch one of the greatest performers that ever lived, Eddie Guerrero, give his blood, sweat, and tears to JBL. What a performance. Join us live next week, June 27th. That's actually my birthday, Jeff. I'm going to spend oh. my birthday with JBL and you at adfreeshows.com. It's going to be live. You'll be on camera. So will JBL. He'll see you and you'll see him. And we'll answer questions at adfreeshows.com. Jeff, there's more than a hundred thousand hours of content at adfreeshows.com. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? It's un freaking believable. Hey, there are some uh, podcast listeners in Tijuana. Uh, literally signed a few uh, things in the lobby that uh, weren't from any other brand other than the my world they did they had these photos made conrad with the my world our our logo on there and it just they had that in sale said sign this i love I it said, you got to get conrad on this i love I said, that so much he ain't in tijuana today <laughs> well you tease it at the start of the show when you're leaving the building you and satnam sing oh my god so you know they don't like me down there right i've heard Where that we're, we're in a baseball that. stadium. And so when it's time to go, they give us the point where our car pickup is. And so we're, we're walking, uh, we're walking across center field and then we get into left field and uh, there's some fans still in the arena that were hollering and booing. And I'll just say some of the Rudos, uh, that's bad guys, uh, to me, 
they went over and signed some autographs. Okay, uh, well, just that's, like, that's not something you should. No, I, I I didn't I didn't particularly care for that, and uh, so Sotnam was about fifteen feet in front of me, and he kept walking, and I went. He just kept on walking and went down in the dugout, and then you go from the dugout underground and up, went up a flight of steps, and then you're going to go go out. And that's when we're going to meet our car service. So let's just say some folks were wanting an autograph from the king of the mountain. Sure. The last outlaw. And for whatever reason, I just decided to start telling a few folks they were number one. You, can you give us a visual representation of how you did that? See that right there. Okay, it's, that's your your jewelry from Karen. Yeah, that, that, I was giving them not that, but yeah, I was giving them that. So anyway, I I, I I had a little fun with fans, and they were eating my ass. Okay, they 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 got all over me. So as we get in the dugout, I get there, and a guy stops me, and this and that, and then they had a cooler of water and you know how cheap I am. Oh, let me grab four or five waters. I got to do my shakes tonight in the morning. So anyway, me and Sotnam got separate. So, okay, no big deal. And I go and I'm sitting at the bottom of the steps and I'm like, okay, where are we going? Where? And I finally asked Hugo, I was like, Hugo, where's Sotnam? He said, oh, he's gone. I said, that son of a gun left. Oh yeah. Yeah. He, he, he's outside. I'm like, okay. So I'm standing there. Here's some technicos, and they go up and they go out. A few more go up and go out. I'm, like, I'm, we're kind of getting down here. This is like the last, like, what is going on? So then I text uh, one of the AAA office folks. Hey, oh, they're the Sotnam's waiting for you. Oh, w- where's he at? He said he's in the car. Oh, okay. So, so I, I don't know how I go up the top of these steps. And I could hear people a little bit more. And I go, oh, no. Th- this ain't good. <laughs> and one of the policemen in broken English and say, you're not going out there. I'm like, huh? He goes, no, 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 people. I'm like, anyway, we open that door and there is a boatload of people. And about 30 of the people that I just flipped off are right out, <laughs> right out the door. They're right out the door. And I'm like, oh, boy. So anyway, I'm going. Well, I ain't walking through that anyway. They did. They, they, the one policeman said, let me get some other guys. And they kind of made a wall to go through. And he was, he went back to old school, 1972, Birmingham, Alabama. The, the, the different stories that you hear, I think somebody got stabbed in Birmingham in the early seventies and another guy got stabbed, but it was, they were all full of cerveza, all of this. And I finally get on the, the, uh, the uh the, the van and Sotnam thought that was comical and I'm like, son of a bitch, leave me one more time. It'll be my ass tripped up here. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, Sotnam, you're seven four. He just he, he just made him scatter. Yes. You know, he he busts through the door. The police are like looking at him anyway. I got the, the one security guy who got on the bus with me. He I'm like, he goes, Yeah, Sotnam didn't have any problem walking to those people. They just scattered. And I said, Yeah, y'all left me to get killed. But Anyway, the cops got me on there. So it's fun, my man. A little bit dangerous, though. That was, that one was a little bit dangerous. So, I, lo- but- I love uh, the heat stories from uh, from you. I mean, I've I've seen it in person. Like I'll never forget when we did Starcast in Nashville. I'm uh, working behind the scenes in our little command center that you've seen at all the Starcasts, and I'm just putting out fires every which way. And then somebody comes and tells me, "Hey, Jeff's about to get in a fight. It's bad." And I'm like, "What?" And and, and I'm like, "What?" what which, 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 what Jeff, Jarrett, Jarrett, he's face to face with a fan. They're screaming. It's bad. And I'm like, Oh God. So I'm going over there. And as I get closer, I think you see me and you realize, cause you're in full blown last outlaw mode. And we make eye contact for just a minute. And I just shake my head and turn around like, it's fine. <laughs> but when you get wound up. I, I bought, I bought it during that time. And I was like, Oh God, here we go. But just I ripped myself a Saturday night. I'm flipping folks off. Yes. Have water break, do this, do that. Oh, and now no. you got to walk through them <laughs> five <laughs> feet from them with, but there was, there was armed guards. And I said, Hey, and I said, I promise you, I won't stop. And they grabbed my, I, I got a, they, I had my briefcase and they grabbed one suitcase in my jacket. I said, 
I promise you, I won't stop if you don't. And the guy just kind of chuckled on through. So. I love it. All fun. All fun. Stay tuned, boys and girls. We'll be back next week right here on my world. Peace.